family has left quite a legacy from Aldo to the children, and uh, they've all made important contributions to, to science. Okay, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Jessica Castillo Vardaro, uh, who's a, a president's postdoc, uh, who's here uh, for a very short time. She's just here for one semester as a president's postdoc uh, because she has a faculty position waiting at San Jose State University, which she's going to start uh, in January. Uh, so if you haven't interacted with Jessica, take advantage of, of her presence. She's sitting in the office next to mine. Uh, and she's, as I said, only here for um, uh, uh, one semester. Uh, many of you probably already know her, though, because she did her undergraduate work at, at Berkeley, uh, and she did an honors thesis with Justin Brashears, uh, something about endangered feces. Yep. <laughs> 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 feces lunch like, 10 years ago. She gave them oh, oh. lunch 10 years ago, and, and also worked on the Grinnell uh, Resurvey uh, Project. Uh, she then went on to do a PhD at Oregon State University where she worked on pikas uh, and then did a postdoc at Princeton uh, with Robert Pringle working on termites in Africa. So you might think, well, what do pikas and termites have in common? Jessica has been very interested in uh, the distribution of genetic variation across landscapes and adaptation and population structure. And so somehow she's going to merge these two things together she says, if there's time, I guess we're going to hear mostly about termites and maybe a little bit uh, about uh, pikas. So, Jessica, welcome back after 10 years. It's great to have you here. Thank you. So, my alternate title. It's there and back. <laughs> so, many of you, you may remember me as an MBZ undergrad. Those of you who don't have probably seen me around, whether it's pictures of me with dead things in the area, or pictures of me with dead things on the GRP website, I think Chris Conroy took this picture. Um, so I recently came back and learned that my field notes are in this cabinet right here, and I was very excited because they're Yay. one notebook away from Charles Camp. And as an undergrad, I loved this particular uh, page in his notebooks, and I think I put it on display at least twice at Cal Day. And then when I was doing my uh, PhD work, I went to Yosemite National Park, so I downloaded these field notes from the MBZ archive, read them, I went to this exact same spot, the Upper Lyle Canyon, 99 years, about to the day after Charles Camp was there, I collected <coughs> samples there, and then I used genetic material from his specimens in a chapter of my dissertation. Then one year later, so 100 years after Charles Camp drew this pika, I defended my dissertation, and the next day I got a tattoo to commemorate the <laughs> <laughs> So my time in the MBZ made a lasting impression on me. It was probably the most influential experience on my career. And I carry the MBZ with me everywhere I go, both figuratively and literally. <laughs> So today I was going to talk about pikas and termites, so from um, mountain peaks to flat savannas, uh, but instead I'm mostly going to talk about termites, um, but I promise there'll be some vertebrates sprinkled in. Um, so many people ask, how did I go from pikas to termites? And I say that there's actually a lot in common between the two. So they're both territorial, they're central place foragers, and they're both extremely charismatic. <laughs> um, but really, this stems from my interest in um, spatial distribution, so the basic question, why are organisms found where they are? What are the causes of that spatial distribution? Is it the distribution of habitat? Is it competition among individuals? Um, is it the um, distribution of resources, competition for resources? And then what are the consequences of that spatial distribution? Um, so the consequences could be within population structure or among population connectivity. And so this is what most of my dissertation work with Pythos focused on. Or in termites, I'm going to talk about how they um, redistribute the resources on the landscape. So in the pika system, the, ha the habitat imposes structure because the pikas are restricted to special age rocky habitats. Whereas the termites actually impose structure on the system through ecosystem engineering. 
So this research is from my first postdoc at Princeton with Karina Tarnita, Rob Kringle, Juan Bonicella, Chris Baker, Dan Doak, and Maylin Pinsky. My fieldwork was at Impala uh, Research Center in Central Kenya. So these are fungus farming termites. Uh, the main one I'm going to be talking about is the genus Vodontotermes. So they build mounds to house their colonies, which consist of a single family. They're central place forages, foragers, so the workers go out, they eat plant material, they bring it back, they defecate on their fungal comb, and the fungus grows <coughs> through their feces, and then uh, they, eat, they eat these uh, fungal nodules, and also the mycelium, which is the kind of white fuzzy looking stuff. So they, they get most of their nutrition from the fungus, not actually from the plants. And they're territorial. So they, they go out and forage, they lay pheromone trails, they um, defend their foraging territories, um, and they'll fight with uh, termites from other colonies. So these odontotermites create large low-lying mounds. There's a mound right here. Um, you wouldn't really know that it's there unless you knew what to look for. So the grass is greener, it's usually shorter. Uh, and this is on the black cotton soil, which is high in clay. It's impossible to drive on when it's wet, and it's really difficult for a lot of plants to grow in. So this black cotton is pretty homogeneous. Uh, there's a few species of trees, grasses, and termites that comprise pretty much all of the diversity. So this one tree, the acacia trypanolobium, the whistling acacia, makes up 97% of the overstory. And one termite species makes about 90% of the mounds. So here's a close-up, kind of looking down view uh, of an active termite mound. So at certain times of the year, they build these um, ventilation shafts. So within their mound, they uh, build all these chambers um, that maintain the mound at an ideal temperature and humidity for the fungus and uh, as well as concentrating nutrients within the mound. So this in turn alters the soil and vegetation properties. Uh, the vegetation on the mound is greener, uh, which is why it stands out in this false color infrared imagery, so the smaller dots are the termite mounds. Uh, so they green up faster and they stay green longer. Um, and so Rob, Karina, and Juan have been working in the system for a long time, <coughs> looking at the causes and consequences of this uh, over-dispersed polka dot spatial pattern. It's a really interesting pattern in itself, but we're also really interested in it because of the cascade, cascading ecological effects. So, for example, the mound distribution influences arthropod abundance and biomass, so there are more uh, spiders closer to mounds, which in turn influences gecko distribution and abundance. So this is gecko abundance plotted in like, the spatial grid. Um, and so the peaks are centered on termite mounds. And then the plants on the mounds are more palatable. Uh, they have higher productivity and diversity. They're unique uh, communities compared to off the mound. So this influences ungulate behavior. So they preferentially graze on the mounds. So we're interested in how local interactions among termites can lead to these large landscape scale patterns. So this is from uh, Juan, Karina, and Rob's 2015 paper where they modeled the vegetation patterns as a function of rainfall vegetation and competition among termite colonies. So they showed that you can create this regular spatial pattern, but then critics argued that you can create the same pattern with just rainfall and vegetation. You don't need termites. So using um, scale-dependent feedbacks, basically local-scale facilitation and larger-scale competition can lead to a polka dot pattern. So how do we know that it's termites? Well, that was the main question that I tried to address in my, in my uh, time there. So we know that competition for resources can produce similar patterns. So this uh, is a figure from Barlow's work in 1974 with tilapia. So we put a bunch of tilapia in a tub with sand bottom. 
the males, when there are only a few of them, make these circular depressions in the sand to attract a mate. But when you overcrowd them, they make a hexagonal territory because hexagons optimize space. <coughs> so basically, they're competing for space. You end up with this six-neighbor hexagon pattern, which is similar to what we see with the termite mounds. So if competition among termite colonies is driving this pattern, then an increase in resources should condense this because you can obtain the same amount of resources within a smaller foraging area. And we can test this hypothesis by looking at resource hotspots. So these large red spots are old cattle corrals, which are called bomas, and then the bomas produce what is called a glade. So the boma is a traditional pastoral practice where they put uh, thorny vegetation uh, to keep the cattle um, enclosed at night, and this leads to an increase in soil nutrients because when they remove the boma, there's a whole bunch of dung, which leads to more productive and more nutritious vegetation, which attracts wild um, bark million herbivores, wild ungulates come preferentially graze on the glade, which then leads to more nutrients on the glade because they're defecating there. So you get this perpetual cycle and these glades can persist on the landscape for a really long time. So in addition to being a hot spot, previous work in Impala has shown that they also produce a gradient of um, resources. So this is uh, dung density with distance to the glade edge, so there's more dung closer to the glades. And I did a bunch of dung surveys around mounds and showed a very similar pattern, particularly for zebras and antelope. And a similar pattern has been shown for various plant species. And dung is relevant to termites because if you go and break open the dung, you most often find either termites or signs of termites. So this is the number of dung for each species and proportion that had termites in them. So this is a relevant resource gradient for termites. So I hypothesized that if competition is driving this over-dispersed spatial pattern, then larger mounds should be further apart because they need more territory to provide enough resources for uh, their colony. And that mounds should be closer together on and near glades because they can obtain that amount of resources within a smaller area when resources are more abundant. So when I went there and looked at glades, that's actually what we found, that we have mounds of similar size on and off glades, but they're much closer together on the glades. And then after I went out and measured and mapped about 300 mounds, we see uh, this trend where uh, as mounds size increases, the distance between neighbors increases, and also as distance from the blade increases, the distance between neighbors also increases. So that supports these hypotheses. But there are also other explanations. So maybe the mounds on the blades are one colony, so you start out with one colony as resources increase, or as they keep getting bigger, they just keep growing and end up with multiple surface um, areas of activity that superficially look like multiple mounds. Or they could be daughter colonies through fission, um, where one colony splits into multiple colonies. Or they could be closely related colonies due to localized dispersal. So all of these hypotheses relate to the idea that you are less likely to compete or be aggressive toward your neighbors if they're really closely related to you. So for some natural history, when the first big rains come, they, they send up their reproductive uh, casts called alates. They emerge, they fly away, there are tens of thousands of them per colony, and most of the colonies do this at the same time, so there are millions of termites flying, and um, everyone is feasting on them, all of the, the, you know, the birds, the dictics, everyone's eating them. Uh, they fly around, find a mate, they land on the ground, drop their wings, burrow down into the ground, and try to start a colony. So 
so in most cases, these colonies are simple families. So they have one founding king and one queen and all of their children. But there could be multiple founding individuals. Um, so this hasn't been shown in this particular species, but in the sister genus Macrotermes, there have been cases with up to like four and five males and two and three females starting a single colony. So it's possible that this is happening here. Or there could be secondary reproductives. So basically you have a, an egg that becomes a larva that, that can then become a nymph that turns into an alate. Or it can become a different type of larva that's either male or female. The females can become soldiers or workers, and then the males become workers. And then before they reach their mature molt, they can become secondary reproductives and stay in the mound and mate with their parents and or their siblings. So these mounds persist on the landscape for decades or centuries, either through replacement by secondary reproductives, or if a colony goes extinct, there can be recolonization by a new founding pair if alates land there and um, take over the empty mound. Okay, so in order to address between colony relatedness, I first had to understand within colony relatedness. So to do this, I uh, used a DDRAD approach. Uh, so I had 3,700 SNPs, 634 termites, 145 mounds. Mean relatedness within a single mound was 0.48, suggesting that they're simple families. And then I calculated effective population size for each of these mounds. 97% of them were consistent with a two-parent family, and then 1.5% each was consistent with a three-parent or a four-parent. So it's possible that there's multiple founding individuals. So then I looked at relatedness between mounds. So we have um, termites from different mounds on the same blade, and then termites from the same mound, but not on glades. And they're significantly different. So the termites from different mounds on glades are not the same colony, and they're not daughter colonies. And I should say that these box plots are arranged in decreasing order of um, median relatedness. So all the mounds on the glades are less than 60 meters apart, so if we compare relatedness between blade mates and similarly distance, or mounts of similar distance. They're also significantly different, and they're actually less related than mounds that are even further apart. So they're not closely related on blades, suggesting that relatedness is not driving this, um, or it's not reducing competition, not driving their um, closer, closer um, distance on blades. And even more striking, um, I sequenced a handful of termites just to see what they were, because they're hard to tell apart. Turns out there are two species, and they're even two species within a glade. Um, so the previous slides were all just from Odontotermes montanus, which is the dominant species. So this is even more proof that these aren't um, just really closely related mounds. And I'll talk a little bit more about these two species later. Okay, so now we know that they're not related, but how do we know if they're aggressive or not? So to address this, I conducted behavior experiments where I took termites from different mounds and put them in an arena. These are termites from the same mound that were separated for 24 hours and then put back together. They don't really do much, kind of go about their business. Not very exciting. Okay, so we have two soldiers they, from, that were separated, they come together, they sense each other, they recognize each other, and they go their separate ways. And then I did this with termites from different mounds, and they immediately start fighting with each other.
So the, <laughs> these aggressive encounters often are fights to the death, but sometimes they just, um, they'll come and they'll do like head shaking or they'll um, snap at each other and then go their separate ways and then avoid each other. So this is showing two termites from one colony and one from a different colony. And so the ones from the same colony, they don't fight, but they both fight with the one that's from a different colony. So they can recognize their colony mates even after 24 hours or 48 hours. Um, they immediately fight with termites from a different colony, but not their own. So last week in the New York Times, there was a book review. Uh, <laughs> and the author said that watching termites required you to turn your internal excitement meter down to just about <laughs> zero. I don't know about you, but I think watching termites fight is pretty exciting. So maybe she just didn't do it right. <laughs> uh, so, in all of my trials, there was at least some fighting among <coughs> termites from different mounds, and termites from the same mound never fought. So I think this is all compelling evidence that competition among termites uh, from different colonies is driving this polka dot uh, pattern in vegetation. So the next step is to modify the existing model, which includes rainfall, vegetation, and competition to include um, more realistic termite mound parameters, and also to add resource heterogeneity to see if we can reproduce these patterns um, with the ultimate goal of tying it back to these landscape scale effects. So I showed you this earlier. Um, previous work at Impala, including work by David Augustine and his group, has suggested that these traditional cattle ranching practices influence the behavior of large mammalian herbivores and have important um, effects on the landscape scale re redistribution of nutrients. Therefore, we need to consider the domestic cattle when we are asking um, ecological questions. We can't just focus on the wild animals in isolation. So I want to take this a step further and argue that these glades lead to nutrient gradients, which lead to gradients in the termite mound density, which again influences the herbivore behavior and amplifies <coughs> the effect that um, the glades have, or the um, cattle ranching has on nutrient redistribution. If we go back to Juan's 2015 paper, here, it, this shows um, vegetation biomass in the whole system without mounds and with mounds as rainfall increases. So in blue, we have uh, increasing rainfall without mounds, you hit a threshold, it increases, and then as rainfall decreases, you hit a threshold, and vegetation biomass drops. But with the presence of termite mounds, you get this buffering effect where they stay, where they green up earlier, and then they stay greener longer. So this leads to a um, more <coughs> robust system overall, especially um, in terms of drought and climate change. <coughs> so when we consider the indirect effects of these traditional pastoral practices, uh, we could potentially manipulate the system to increase the robustness, say, by placing new BOMAs in a regular spatial pattern as compared to a clumped pattern. So that's what we're playing around with the model, is how can we adjust um, these resource hotspots? Uh, what does that do to the overall system productivity? So I hope I convinced you that competition has landscape scale effects. But what are they competing for? And how do these two different species persist on the black cotton in such um, different abundance? So um, these two species, well, this, this group is really difficult. Um, it's problematic. There have been a couple of phylogenetic studies, uh, but this group is still not very well resolved. So this is Montanus, uh, what's called Montanus, um, and the red arrow are uh, identical to my sequences. And then here's ANCEPs. So the experts are having a really difficult time telling them apart. Um, how are they different? Their mounds look the same. Um, I can't tell them apart. So the question is, are they functionally redundant or are they doing something different? 
so that was on the black cotton. And if we look on the mixed soil, so where the black cotton and the red soil meet, which I'll call transition soil sometimes in this talk too. I'll try to be consistent, but figure say transition soil. Um, it transitions from black to red. So there are six mound building species on this mixed soil, um, <coughs> including five fungus growing species, uh, three odontotermes and two macrotermes. With these macrotermes, I found only two <coughs> mounds of the second species, and so I'm not sure what's going on there. I don't, I need to go back and um, I guess look at more mounds to see whether uh, that is just restricted to the areas that I was looking. Anyway, <laughs> interesting things with uh, the termites on the black cotton and the red soil. And then this sixth species is a trinerva termes. Um, so they have this pointy head and they shoot liquid, uh, nasty liquid to deter predators. <laughs> um, so these are the main species that I'm looking at on the black cotton, or the the mixed soil. Just to give you an idea of what that looks like, so here's me on the black cotton, pretty homogeneous, and then the mixed soil, um, a lot more plant diversity, also a lot more bare ground, um, so there's more understory vegetation on the black cotton. And then this is the uh, macrotermes now, just for comparison. <laughs> so, I'm looking at intraspecific variation of Odontotermes montanus because it's found abundantly on both soil types. Interspecific competition between the two Odontotermes species on the black cotton and the six species on the mixed soil. First, to ask the very, very basic question, what are they eating? So there have been a lot of studies looking at this, but almost exclusively with stable isotopes, which can tell you if they're eating grasses or woody vegetation. So it doesn't really give you a fine scale um, idea of their diet. And then finally, I want to ask whether there is niche partitioning um, to get at you know, how are these different, so many different species persisting in such close proximity. So to do this, I used a diet metabarcoding approach. So my lab mates in Princeton have been doing this with animal dung. So you extract DNA from undigested plant cells, then amplify a specific gene, and compare that to a database of known sequences. So I'm doing this with my termites. I'm chopping off their abdomens and extracting DNA from the worker termites. Specifically, the chloroplast tRNL gene and then comparing it to the same database that my lab mates use for the mammal dung at Impala. So this is essentially trace DNA, so it's a very small quantity, and so I only looked at presence absence, and in order to consider something present, I, uh, it had to be detected in two of three replicate PCRs. So this is a kind of a summary uh, showing the termite species over here and the plant species here, each bar is a single plant taxa color coded by family and the width of the bar represents the number of samples in which it was detected. So the takeaway from this is that they all seem to be eating pretty much everything, but especially grasses and uh, the base seed, which is primarily the acacias but also a bunch of other um, legumes. So when we look at diversity, this is three different metrics, so richness and then Shannon and Simpson diversity uh, for the black cotton, the mixed soil, and then all locations combined. Uh, and so on the black cotton, the Montanus has greater diversity than Anseps, but um, oh, I should mention that it's color-coded by termite species. The solid line is um, interpolated and the dashed line is extrapolated. So if you look where um, the metrics are interpolated, they're really overlapping. So um, I'm not sure you know, if I were to collect more ANSEP samples, that's hard because there's a few of them, maybe we get slightly different. But it is clear that the macrotermes has the most diverse 
um, diet for all three metrics, and it only really overlaps the, the, the yellow one, which is odontotermia zimbiensiensis, which is not found on the black cotton. So these are NMDS plots of Ray Curtis similarity for vegetation surveys. So I did pin uh, frame surveys on the mounds and then on a 40-meter uh, transect through the mound. Um, and then this third plot is the termite diet. So the two species on the, oops, that, that's uh, the two species on the black cotton are indistinguishable both vegetation on the mound and in their diet. So then if we look at Odontotermes montanus on the two different soil types, um, we see that there is a difference in the diet. So they're not specializing on any particular plant or group of plants. They're eating whatever is available. And when we look, look at the different species on the mixed soil, there's <coughs> some support that the macrotermes are different. Um, but overall, there's a lot of overlap. And I only am um, showing center deviation ellipses for the three species that I had. I'm not uh, sample size, but you can see by the colors of the symbols, they're all kind of overlapping. So this figure is showing the proportion of samples um, with detections in the termite diet compared to the vegetation surveys for the black cotton and then for the mixed soil. And then selectivity, so looking at presence absence compared to the relative um, presence in the vegetation surveys. And uh, there are a few species that termites seem to be avoiding. So red is high avoidance and blue is high selectivity. So, um, for example, these species here, um, looks like they might be avoiding them. And then there are a couple uh, plants that the macrotermies is selecting for, um, but the other ones appear to be avoiding. <coughs> so maybe the macrotermies is excluding the other termites from these, um, these plants. But this is presence absence data, so it's kind of hard to tell. So what did we learn? Uh, the termites are diet generalists. There is a high degree of overlap among the species, and macrotermies has the most diverse uh, and different diet. I mentioned earlier that uh, you often find termites in dung. This is what that looks like. So sometimes you'll find termites, but most of the time you just find termite mudding and they replace the entire inside of the dung with mud. Um, so I showed this figure earlier. Now it's broken down by termite species, but here in purple is where it's obvious that there were termites there, but I don't know what species they were. So I decided to apply the plant metabar coding methods to the mammal DNA um, in the termite gut to try and get at the <coughs> importance of mammal dung in the termite diet. So this is a, a summary of the, those results. I did an experiment to test uh, how well this method is working. Um, happy to talk about it about it later, basically there seems to be a really high false negative, but a very low false positive um, in the mammal detections. So this figure here is showing a map of, so the black cotton is in gray, and then the mixed soil here, the, um, they're colored by whether they had plant detections, so the gray symbols had plant detections but no mammal detections. The white symbols had mammal and plant detections, and then the circles are the mixed soil and the triangles are the black cotton. Um, and then over here we have the proportion of my dung surveys for each of the mammal species. So I did dung transects around each of my termite mounds. Um, and then these four uh, are the number of DNA detections in my termite samples with the termite sample size in parentheses below. And so some of them had um, multiple detections within a single termite sample. And the main takes, takes, 
takeaways from this figure uh, are that there are fewer positive detections on the black continent than on the mixed soil. And that, again, the macrotermes has more detections, but also greater diversity. Um, and I guess I should mention that the uh, mammal species aren't um, necessarily the same because it's really hard to tell um, the different type of um, antelope down the park in the field, especially when they're happy. Um, so interestingly, there's more dung on the black <coughs> cotton than on the mixed soil. So this shows the dung density um, and the proportion of bare ground hits my vegetation surveys. So there's more dung and more vegetation, or more understory vegetation on the black cotton. Um, so this suggests that the termites are consuming more dung when the vegetation is sparse. So it's a more important resource when there's less vegetation, which makes sense. Which brings us back to this figure and makes me wonder if the macrotermies are excluding the other termites from the dump. So to get at that, I again um, paired termites from different mounds. Um, and this time, I counted how many termites were dead after an hour. So these figure or these points <coughs> are either um, pairs of the same species with open circles or different species with closed circles. The closer they are to the dotted line, the more evenly matched they are. Uh, these guys here, they fought, but they didn't kill each other. And then here are the macrotermies. So basically, when you have macrotermies, they kill all the other termites. Um, and to give you an idea what that looks like. So here, two macrotermies soldiers and workers, and uh, Adonstermies ambiziensis. And basically, they chop their heads off and <laughs> chomp them to bits. And if you throw the macrotermies in there, they just decimate everyone else. Um, so here's another picture of um, Odontotermes and Macrotermes. So, those, so the, the Macrotermes have two soldiers. They have a major, or a major soldier and a minor soldier. The major soldier is just enormous. Um, and in its mouth is the decapitated head of an Odontotermes <laughs> soldier. So these soldiers are approximately the same size, but then when this guy comes in, he just plows through everyone else. And then these are dead Odontotermes workers. So I still have a lot of questions about this. Um, so why do two ecologically similar species persist on the black cotton at such different <coughs> abundance? Um, is this a new phenomenon? Did they just arrive on the scene? Um, is this ephemeral? Um, do they come from somewhere else? They get established, but they're just going to disappear at some point in the future? Or are they interbreeding? Um, and then why do we have so many species in close proximity on the mixed soil? They're often much closer together than the mounds on the black cotton. Um, and finally, why don't the macrotermies just wipe them all out? Is it because they're avoiding each other? So they lay pheromone trails. Maybe when they're foraging, if they encounter another termite's trail, they just turn and walk away. Or it could be because of the relative number of termites. So for example, if a macrotermies encounters another species, it'll kill it but maybe they know to avoid getting too close to the mound because they'll be outnumbered. So to get at this question, I did just a few trials where I started with one, sol one Adonstermes soldier and one Macrotermes major soldier, and then two and then three, and basically it took me to a ratio of eight Odontotermes to one Macrotermes before the macrotermies could not immediately kill them all. And in this case, what happened was these all ganged up on this guy and ripped all his legs off. So he's still alive, and they're now avoiding it, but they just left it there to, to suffer. Um, so I'll leave you with this brutal image uh, to think more about what's going on with the termites and uh, I'm happy to talk about this more. This is the first time I'm presenting this and I'm still working through it. 
um, and have a little bit of time. Mm, very quickly um, to talk about Pico. <laughs> so Pico's are typically found at high elevation, but not always. They're documented local extinctions, um, but mostly at the Great in the Great Basin at lower elevations in these more isolated um, mountain ranges. And so climate, based on climate predictions, people have suggested that there'll be an upward shift in the lower elevational limit of montane species, uh, eventually resulting in the <laughs> extinction of termites which will be pushed off of the mountaintops. So this is very oversimplified, highly exaggerated, but it's gotten a lot of attention. Um, so this suggests that in order to avoid extinction, the um, pikas and other montane species need to either shift their range to more environmental conditions, adapt to their new environment, or maybe there's enough phenotypic plasticity for them to persist. And they're already at the high elevation and they have low dispersal, so that's probably not gonna happen. Uh, climate change is happening really quickly, uh, so we don't know about these other two possibilities. So what I'm currently uh, planning on doing, and part of the reason why I'm here, is to look at selection through space and time in one pika group um, in the Sierra Nevada's Great Basin and the Lower Cascades. Uh, this is museum specimens. To identify signals of adaptive variation in these different mountain ranges uh, along latitudinal, elevational, and climatic gradients, um, using an exon capture approach, um, and then test for associations with environmental variables that are important to pikas, such as temperature, precipitation, and growing season, uh, potentially identify physiological pathways, uh, and then ultimately to ask whether we see present day signals of adaptive variation and if these are mirrored um, in what we see through the museum specimens. Uh, so, our changes over the last hundred years, similar to changes or differences along um, different environmental gradients that we see today. And then lastly, uh, I recently uh, published this paper showing that there are two subspecies of pikas in Rocky Mountain National Park, um, and there's evidence for gene flow between them, so I want to look at whether this gene flow is directional, if it's sex biased, I want to look at their vocalizations because they have different dialects um, and how does it affect their behavior and their mating. I want to look at parasites, diet, their microbiome, and stress. So <laughs> if you want to talk about any of these things, um, come find me. Someone can get the lights. Uh, we have time for questions. The other, way. <laughs> other way with the lights. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, is this a Samburu area? No, it's in Kola, which is near Mount Kenya. Yeah. So I, mean, I, the, I think the, Samburu. The, tri the tribe that built the bones. Oh. I think those were up in that region. Yeah, it's nearby, so I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. Yes? Did you do any experiments with the chemist uh, termites, the ones that have the, the spray defense? Mm -hmm. How did those fare against the other species? <coughs> so against the macrotermines, they just destroyed them. Um, and I think they fared a little better against the other termites. My understanding is that it is primarily a defense against ants. It, is there any evidence that um, they hybridize, or is there any potential uh, for hybridization between these coexisting species? I don't know. I want to look at that. But, yeah. Yes. I guess these bulmas have been there essentially forever, but are there any areas where they're there no more bulmas historically in this, uh, this black cotton. So if you look on the black cotton, there are parts where you know there's like a kilometer 
where there aren't any of these bombers. And so there, the mounds are further apart. Um, but I mean, there are a lot of them just scattered throughout because it's really good grazing habitat for the cows. Um, but they are kind of clustered in some areas. Um, yeah, the areas surrounding Impala are actively managed for cattle, so it might be interesting to compare, but there might also be a lot of other things going on there, too. I, I don't remember. Um, were the macrotermies generalist uh, in their diet, or, yeah, like yeah. just so uh, were all of them? I mean, yeah. they all seem to be okay. eating everything. Everything, yeah. Yeah. So I saw sweet potato on your list, and a lot of a lot of them were eating. Uh, that seemed to be like a a, a column of of blue. Um, this one? Oh no! I, uh, it's not even on on there. But uh, in the in the arrays when you were um, you had the red and blue circles uh, for. I don't think I had any plants. Yeah, I can lay on there, yeah. Oh, that one. <laughs> Sorry, I... <coughs> this one. Yeah. What was your... Second from the right, that vertical column. Um, yeah, so... Yeah. I... Yeah. Whoops. I didn't find it on the black cotton. Okay. Um, and I found it in low frequency on the transition soil. Oh, okay. But a lot of them were eating it? Am I reading that right? Down below? So this yeah. Ozambesiensis, yeah, they're eating it. Okay. Um, they're all eating it, except the Trinovitermes. Okay. Just, yeah. Just I curious. think that those, like, that has to be an introduction because I, I'm pretty sure Ipomea is a new world taxa. It's not native to the old world. So all of all of these species um, have been identified at Impala and sampled and sequenced. So I'm comparing my sequences to the existing database specific to Impala. Okay. So all these ones are there. I don't know about their history. There are a lot of non-native species that have been introduced there. Because yeah, again, if that is sweet potato, that is like that is a at least sweet potato since it's stricto is definitely new world. It was introduced by a trade, but it is yeah. You know, so if that's a feral sweet potato, it might be interesting. It actually is interesting to see that well, not a lot of the termites are even utilizing it, and it is a non-native taxon. If that is a, a non-native item. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still perplexed by this idea that they're all generalists <coughs> and they're coexisting. Are there other right. aspects of the, the environment, other resources that uh, might allow them to coexist or, you know, fine grain differences in soil or something else? So there are... Let's see. Um, so you know, it's kind of speckled, the black soil, the red soil. Um, so, you know, th that scale, there are fine grain differences, and there are different plants growing in the different soil types. You know, we talked about this, and you really think maybe it does come down to competition and avoidance. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you can find a macrotermes, and then 10 feet away, an odontotermes, but on the black cotton, you never find odontotermes closer than 20 meters from each other, unless they're right on the blades. So, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we're also looking at the spatial pattern of these mounds to see whether they maintain the spatial pattern, whether they interrupt each other's spatial pattern, is it driven by the underlying soil type? So there are a lot of questions about where their mounds are that we haven't um, addressed yet. Yeah. This is 
is a long shot, but are they partitioning time differently? That's a really good question, too. Um, you know, are they partitioning time? Are they partitioning different parts of the plant? Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know. So they, they mostly forge at night, I think, but when they forge during the day, they build these little, little tunnels that they, they forge in. Um, I don't know. It's a good question. All right. Well, let's thank <laughs> Jessica one more time.